Hi everyone and welcome to the HIP podcast. This is my series, Tech Transformation and Change. This is what I'm going to be talking about over the next forever how long. I'm really excited. I've had the pleasure over the last few months to meet a lot of incredible people and I'm building panels together to talk about challenges, insights. You know, I want to build a community, bring together because I think, you know, we all have the same goal of improving the tenant journey. So my name is Caitlin Knox and I am the host and I'm really delighted to be kicking off uh, my first episode with this lovely panel who will introduce themselves shortly shortly a bit about the structure as well I've invited them both to bring their own questions um the goal is to just, just have a good conversation so I'll pass it over to the floor to introduce yourselves oh hi thanks for inviting me along I'm Nick Atkin I'm a chief exec at Yorkshire Housing so like most chief execs I just mooch around uh, do very little and uh, sign off the old strategy and uh, and sort of take it from there but now I suppose my job's really to steer the organization in its long-term sort of direction Thank you very much for having me. Sounds like Nick's job is much more interesting and impressive than mine. But um, so yeah, I'm I'm Jason Wickens. I'm the Chief Information Officer at Southern Housing Group. So my role really is is to sort of be accountable for the strategic direction of the technology, data, and business transformation functions. And I've been with Southern Housing for about four and a half years now. And Jason's done a much better job than me, hasn't he? Because I didn't say how long I've been at Yorkshire. I didn't say I'm very polished at all. So I've, I've been at Yorkshire three and a half years. So thanks, Jason. Uh, I'm going to. I've got a feeling I'm going to be following you all in your wake on this podcast. Oh, I, I doubt it, Nick. I doubt it. So my first exam question was: What one thing would you change about the way that housing services are currently delivered? And the reason I ask this question is because I absolutely believe that the whole housing service offer is fundamentally broken. It's the wrong way round. And if uh, somebody landed from Mars and looked at the general landlord offer, they just scratch their head and wonder why on earth we did things as, as they do. So what do I mean by that? Well, at the moment, we wait for things to happen. And not only do we wait for things to happen, but we then wait for our customers to tell us those things have happened. And then we respond in a really unplanned, uncoordinated, from a customer point of view, very inconvenient way, and from a business point of view, very expensive way. In other words, we react rather than preempt. So my overarching aim and the the focus that Yorkshire Housing has is to completely turn on its head that service offer from being reactive to being preemptive. The next question I always get asked is, well, how are you going to do that? And I suppose it's a combination for me of three key elements. I think the first element is to really get our homes to help us communicate information to us. Um, At the moment, our homes are pretty much still kitted out the same way they were in the 1950s, just that the kitchen door fronts look a bit different and we might have a shower instead of a bath. But generally, very little's changed. Our homes are still done. And actually, the tech is there, it's available, it's cheap as chips, it's disposable. And actually, we could have smart connected homes that are actually communicating with us on a live basis. And the second element is data. We as housing organisations have data to die for, but we do bugger all with it generally, partly because some of it is unclean, um, unreliable or inaccurate. Um, So there's a whole thing about data cleansing and data control, and I'm sure uh, that'll be music to Jason's ears. But also, um, we, you know, we don't employ data analysts. We don't employ people who are, who can look at a set of data and say, actually, from an analysing that, these events are going to happen. And thirdly, the other element that um, is key to this shift is uh, real-time customer sentiment. I don't mean customer satisfaction surveys that says, we did a repair 18 months ago. How, how was it? Did somebody turn up looking nice and whatever? But actually using open source data, scraping social media networks, understanding what the real time issues are that are affecting our customers' lives so that we can respond to that. I think once you're able to do that, you can shift a service offer from being reactive to to being preemptive. And they're the three foundation pillars that we're building at Yorkshire Housing at the moment. From a customer point of view, interestingly, this will be quite an organic shift. I don't think our customers generally will notice this shift over Um, say, the next two to three years. But for our colleagues, this is a massive shift. This is a complete reversal for many of them of how they have been hardwired to deliver a housing service. And so the challenge, interestingly, is not with our customers. I think our customers will will be you know, quite happy with uh, how those services organically move along. But our colleagues, I think, are on a real journey on some of this. And I think it will also, it won't be right for some people. And for some people, they'll want to take a different path. 
great opportunity there for uh, recruitment organisations to bring in new talent who do get some of this. Quick plug there, Caitlin. But the other side to it is that, you know, we need to help our people adapt to this. And just in case there's any FDs listening, then, you know, why would you do this? Well, the average repair costs five times more. The same repair costs five times more to be done out of hours as it does to be done as a planned uh, repair. And you think how many repairs you do each year. But also, it's not just about repairs. It's also about tenancies ending. And for example, at Yorkshire Housing, our average cost to turn around a, a tenancy is £2,300. We have about 1,600 tenancy changes a year. So that's £4 million. If we were able to prevent 10% of those tenancies from ending, that's 400 k real money back into the bottom line. And I think if you then multiply that across the housing sector that just the sums are eye-watering and i think there's some massive massive efficiencies that we can do as well as massive changes and improvements to the customer service offer final point final quick tip as as this is being sort of hosted by an organization that specializes in recruitment it's a bit like you sort of say well how do you know that a tenancy is ending well there are lots of signals in the same way there are lots of signals that i know colleagues are are at risk of leaving us And the main one is when an existing colleague connects with me on LinkedIn, there's only one or two reasons that they do that. Either they've just started with us or they're looking to move on and they want their profile to look even better by being connected to the chief exec. And at Mm. that point, that triggers me having a conversation with their manager to say, is Jason okay?" They'll sort of say, yeah, I think so. When did you last speak to Jason? You might want to go have another conversation with him because he's now a flight risk. So a quick insight in terms of uh, how how you can use LinkedIn for uh, for some more subtle checks and balances. Yeah. Uh, but I'll, I'll pause there. Loads there. It's, it's a subject I'm really enthusiastic about. So I'll, I'm going to go on mute so that uh, Jason can come in. Going back, Nick, to the question that you poised, it, it really took me some time to sort of distill down because there were many things I can think of that in my time in housing that would sort of spring to mind. I think what I got to really was, for me, the, the one thing I would really say that would, that could help with changing how housing services are delivered is to learn from some out-of-sector experience that is, yeah. that's available. And, you know, I still pinch myself daily that I, I've been now in housing nearly five years. I came very much from out-of-sector. And I think you used the phrase earlier about, you know, if someone landed from Mars. And for me, it was very much how I felt in my early days, because, you know, it's a really interesting sector, lots to learn. I still feel very new, still got a lot of veterans around me that know a lot more about the core housing processes. But I think what I've tried to bring during my time at Southern and and, and in sector is, you know, my background in the private sector, retail, consulting, and really taking a fresh look at how we deliver things. So sometimes asking the question, it sounds really cliche, why? Why do we do it that way? And often it's, well, we've we've always done it that way. So for me, it's it's coming in, challenging status quo a little bit. And it takes a risk for some people to hire somebody out of sector because there is, you know, there are certain roles where you do need to have really strong housing knowledge. But I think for supporting functions and particularly the role that, that I have, it's about enabling the business to do things in the most efficient and smart way that it can. So... Think about, you know, reactive to proactive. We've, you know, during the time I've been here, we've launched a new a new online repairs portal. And, you know, quite a lot of online digital capability for our residents to view their rent statements, pay their rent, et cetera, et cetera. Really try to transform that digital journey because, again, to your point, actually the sector is very, very data rich, but quite info poor because we don't have the ability to use that data very effectively and often we don't trust it. So... If I really try to boil it down to what is it that we could do differently, it's I'm not saying we can't learn things by people in the sector, because absolutely we can. But there are a lot of people and there's a lot of great talent out there that could be brought in from all levels to just start to challenge and say, why do we do it that way? Because actually some of the things that I've seen in the sector are actually almost things that were implemented in other sectors five, ten years ago. And the sector has been quite poorly served, in my view, technically. But there's so much amazing opportunity and great goodwill in the sector that I think it's it's actually quite exciting with what's with what's possible. Yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely agree. And I think, you know, you, you're right about being sort of recruitment blind in terms of just for me, it doesn't really matter whether people have got eight 
million years housing experience or no housing experience i'm interested in the mindset i'm interested in in somebody who gets the concept and then can can actually make get, make that happen and get it delivered so you know i absolutely concur with what you say i think you know there's a risk of groupthink and i think also if we're really honest you know the housing sector has had no burning platform. So it's had no reason to really change. Even during the lockdown, when if you remember those early days of lockdown, when the economy was in free fall, there were only two sectors that got additional funding from the government at that point. One was the NHS and the other was housing. So you just sort of think we've never had that need to radically look at our business model and how, how we deliver services. We've also got quite a captive audience. You know, our customers have, have got very little choice in in terms of where they where they go because of the scarcity of, of social housing and of, of good quality affordable housing. So in many ways, it's not surprising we are where we are. But, you know, I suppose there's also the opportunity to, to learn from other sectors. And I, and I think you're right. If you look at things like retail, like banking, they've just gone, you know, they've gone through huge revolutions in how they were. You, you, remember, you think about how banking was pre-2008. You know, you had to traipse off to a bank branch to do most of your transactions. Now, admittedly, you know, their sort of driver around change was was a financial crash and the need to save lots of money very quickly. But, you know, they completely overhauled their customer offer. And and I can't remember the last time I went into a, a bank branch. You know, I don't even know where my bank branch is. Probably, probably is not even open anymore. But it's also a bit like our homes, when I talk about homes being done, it's a bit like where cars were 40 years ago. So 40 years ago, you used to buy a car and you had no idea whether it was going to break down or not. So you bought a breakdown policy as well for somebody to come and tow you away when you broke down. And sure enough, it would break down two or three times a year. Now your car, your car tells you, doesn't it, if it's not well, it goes into limp mode. It even for some vehicles, it even contacts the nearest dealer and, tell, and they then ring you and say, and you just think that's where we need to be, that sort of offer, as opposed to, still driving around and apologies because there'll be some of the listeners that have no idea what I'm about to say but driving around in the equivalent of a 1985 Ford Escort when actually we live in a Tesla world. Cheers Nick thanks for bringing that question with you today all right let's move on to the next one for you then Jason. So it's starting I guess to lead on from some of the things that we've, that we've just discussed which was thinking about what really are the main areas of opportunity for digital transformation within the sector and this is a a subject that I could talk at length about and in a hopefully short, interesting and succinct podcast, I'll try not to do that. But I know from my time in sector and, you know, networking and trying to get out there with CIOs and chief execs and exec teams, etc., that pretty much the issues that housing associations and RPs are facing are the same. You know, there are some differences, but pretty much we're all trying to solve the same problems. We all know that we have issues with repairs. We all know that we want to try to improve the service for our residents, etc. But I'd be really interested to hear, Nick, and, and, and your perspective, really, Kate, and, uh, I've got my views, but what do you think are the main areas of opportunity for digital within the sector? I think the first one is around ease of access to services. And at the moment, you know, the housing service is still well, there's only housing and education that still operate a nine to five, Monday to Friday. Well, education is not even nine to five, is it? For me, it's about how do we provide a really high quality digital offering for those that want it so that that frees up the time for colleagues at the moment who are just processing requests for things to actually provide real high quality support for those people who really need it. So if you look at the sort of average sort of span of tenancies that most organisations have, 70% of our customers just what I would call will be transactional. So for them, something like a really high quality self-serve that directly interfaces to your, to your housing system, does workflow out the other end, so nobody's touching it, it's seamless, the customer gets an immediate appointment, and then, you know, that whoever's going to their home has that through workflow and is able to sort of arrive, everything, everything works as it should do. And that then frees up time for the remaining 30%. And of that 30%, there are 20% who have changes in their lives, um, as we all do, and need a little bit of support, uh, need a little bit of help. If I suppose if you if you think about it in terms of the first group are those that you just teach to deal with things in a different way. So it's a bit like a swimming instructor. For the second group, it's about putting a bit of air in, in their life jacket and letting them then be able to, to adapt and get back on with their lives. 
But the whole point of this is that there are 10% of our customer base who lead really complex, difficult lives. And certainly when I meet them, you know, I'm just in awe sometimes that they're able to just live day to day. I'm, I'm not so sure I could cope with some of the challenges that have some of those people are me. And they're the people that we need to provide more intensive tenancy support for. And at the moment, it's the same jam for everybody. And actually, it's about providing a much more targeted level of support. And that's what self-serve gives. Now, unfortunately, there's still some people in our sector who think self-serve is is like doing a deal with, with Satan. You know, they still sort of think that, you know, we shouldn't be telling people to hang out washing on a Sunday and, you know, that there should be somebody walking down the street sort of knocking on every door every every week. You know, that's not real life. For them, and we also need to get over ourselves as a landlord. The majority of our customers view us as a hygiene factor. They don't want a big relationship with us. They just want us to do stuff when they need it doing. The rest of the time, they need us out the way. And we probably need to get over ourselves and probably be a bit more honest and realistic about you know yeah. what, how our customers do view us. So that's the first one. Second one, really easy and much quicker, smart homes, going back to what we chatted about before in terms of how that can really improve the, the service offer for customers, but also identify those, for example, who are at risk of, of disrepair, particularly as we're entering a phase where people are, going, are making that, that shocking choice between heat and eat and people disconnecting mm-hmm. gas supplies, which we're now having and the, the problems that that's creating. And the third element is goes back again to, to what I said before around data analytics and and just using that data and the power of that data to enable us to you know really target our support and our services to where they're really needed, but also to do lots and lots of trend analysis so that we're able to to work out what the right things are for for the future as well as we plan what homes for the future what they need to look like where they need to be and who they need to be there for. I think what's worked well for us has been on the first aspect you spoke about is really not making any assumptions of what your residents need, you know, providing them with channel of choice, because some may not want to self-serve. Some may want to contact you, you know, not, 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 you know, not everyone wants to choose a digital experience. And yes, there are efficiencies to come from that. But I think being truly omni-channel is a a benefit to the organisation, but also your residents. But for me, I, you know, I've been passionate for many years about, um, and this, this phrase is now coined around what we do here, um, but really designing services from the from the outside in. So, you know, you could take lettings, you could take repairs, you could take any core process and say, the resident, the customer, doesn't really care that there's six teams internally involved in getting something from start to finish. They care about getting the thing done. And it's about, you know, we created a, a sort of service design function within Southern where whenever we've done any digital work, we've spent time really understanding what the customer wants. And when we, you know, when we say customer, that can equally be resident as much as it could be internal colleague, because giving a colleague the right experience means that they can do their job more efficiently. You know, they can provide a better service and ultimately it can drive down cost, which means we can put more into investing into new homes. So I think one of the things for me that I've also seen across the biggest opportunity is just taking a fresh look at how we design the services. Really, how efficiently could it run and who is the end customer in this? And then making that journey as easy as possible, which as a result may mean internal restructures to support a new digital process as opposed to getting a system to fit a structure. Absolutely. And it's about also shattering some of those those lazy, misplaced assumptions that people have in the business and they act as blockers to some of that change. So, you know, people sort of say, oh, well, all our customers want to ring a call centre. Do they really? It's a really crap experience because you ring, you've got to know your sort of date of birth, you've got to know your dog's maiden name, your inside leg measurement before anybody will speak to you. It's a really clunky process and it's it's not. It's not great at all. And, you know, would I rather have that or would I rather look at my my phone, you know, and and or use biometrics and, and go straight in through an app and get it all appointed and not have to sort of go through all that nonsense? And whilst I'm on biometrics, you know, the other thing, you know, about how we how we, we can use sort of tech much better, you know, I still can't believe we use a 15th century technology to secure our homes. They're called keys. And if somebody gave me a phone and said, oh, and by the way, the way that you lock that is we've got a key 
He'd be like, there's no way on this earth, is there? And so all the biometric stuff is there. If we're using it to open our laptops, our phones, we're trusting it to, you know, get onto our systems where we've got, you know, obviously the risk of cyber attacks. Why on earth aren't we using that to actually make getting in and out of our yeah. homes a lot easier and a lot uh, more, a more of a seamless process for, for customers? I, I just don't get it. And how many thou- hundreds of thousands of pounds do each of us spend every year chasing keys around our respective organizations yeah. it's just a nonsense so there's definitely some amazing tech out there now in the space of smart homes like you say um you know it's an area that we've been exploring for a while but even in the space of, of um, sustainability right looking at how we can make our homes in more energy efficient for our residents thanks jason another brilliant question there too all right let's move on to the your last question from you then nick one of the big topics at the moment is how we, you know, address the talent drain or the race for talent or whatever phrase you want to, you know, refer to it. But it's about how the housing sector can be more attractive to potential candidates. And I, and I think, you know, I've got three kids and, you know, I hate them all. And one of the things that they've they've never done is grown up and said, you know what, I want to work in housing. It's a career that's, that's unknown, but actually once people fall into it, and most people do fall into it, they love it and, and struggle to get out. And, you know, interesting, Jason, you know, you've, you've been sucked in and I suspect you, you'll you never get out again now. You're here for good. But I, I think it's about how we make that offer because we can't pay, we can't continue this sort of ridiculous sort of increase in pay that, you know, perhaps other sectors are, are on with at the moment. And so for me, it's around how we make the working offer much better. And certainly at Yorkshire Housing, we've really pushed the margins of flexible working so my view is that work is something you do, not somewhere you go and that you don't have to be in work to be in work. I don't give a toss when people work, provided they deliver the outcomes we've agreed. Because as humans, we all operate at different times. We're recording this podcast towards the back end of the day. And unfortunately, I'm not on great form at the end of the day. If you'd have done this first thing in the morning, I'd be absolutely buzzing and, and sharp as a razor. But there are some of my colleagues who are only just coming around at this point. So, you know, it's about how you get the most out of people as humans. But it's also about how you create a workspace that's really engaging and exciting. And and again, we've really pushed the boundaries on that in terms of creating a workspace, which, you know, we don't have any desks. There's no traditional desk spaces at all. And um, it's all built around collaboration. It's all around moving around that, that space to use the spaces for different purposes and then moving on. We also trust people. Everybody's on home-based contracts. We trust people to hire spaces that are close to where they work. We're big advocates for the 20-minute neighbourhood, which is around, you know, reducing our carbon footprint as a business, but also enabling people to not have to commute and drive and all that nonsense. And so all of that is a big thing. And I think the focus has probably been too much on recruitment. Sorry, Caitlin, I know this will be big, big for you guys, but I think we don't place enough emphasis on retention and it's how do you retain really good people as well and for me it's about actually creating a working offer that's so good that people do take for granted people take for granted what they've got around them so only when they're thinking of stepping outside that to go and look at another opportunity that they realize being told that they have to be in the office a certain number of days per week or even specified days each week and they go back into you know, something akin to a 19th century workhouse where people are, you know, made to sit at a desk for certain numbers at certain hours of the day. All of that makes them go, you know what? I hadn't really valued what I've got at Yorkshire Housing, but I'm blinking well staying now because I ain't going back in time to what that is. And I think COVID was a massive, mass did us a massive favour. And I think it just acted, it just supercharged what was already bubbling under and starting to happen but in an organic way and it's just made that absolutely skyrocket through in terms of pace and i think where we're at now and i think it's all the, i think the dust is still settling from this but i think we're at a position where there are two types of organization there are those that have resorted to a bc type of working before covid and there are others who have gone and taken advantage of of this new working arrangement. And it means that, for example, for us, we've been able to downsize. So we now operate on a floor space that's 30% of what we originally had. So that's why I've asked the question. For me, this was a big challenge when I first entered the sector. You know, coming from very different experience with a very different compensation structure, and I guess a very different set of offerings that you could share. I would completely agree COVID did a massive, if there was any silver lining, you know, for me, it was it did accelerate the ability to be 
I'd refer to it as nimble in the office and, you know, change the way that we work. I think in the sector, there are a few levers that as leaders we can and can't pull. So one is often pay. It's quite immovable. We're never going to be able to offer the salaries to attract some people from other sectors that have key skills that we want. But I do think there are areas of opportunity where, speaking about this from first hand, this is a really interesting sector. And often it's not particularly well known. So, you know, getting out there and, and spreading the word of social housing and the real the real heart of what these organisations do is a, is, is a big pull for some people. You know, definitely for me, for me personally, I think if you if you're not in touch with the workforce and and the sector more broadly, you will see people will start to vote with their feet. We've already seen that they will get attracted by other things, and you'll start to completely bang on Nick. It's the retainment that's going to be the issue, because yes, you could you could engage a a recruitment consultancy, or you could go and attract talent, but it's the institutional knowledge that you're using. It's the time that you're investing in that individual to, to upskill them. For me, I think there's a number of things we can do, which is particularly around promoting really flexible working. And for me, flexible working is equally, you know, being really open to geographic location. Yeah, so absolutely. as much as we're trying to encourage and value um, you know, neurodiversity, there's no difference with geographical diversity. So people could be based nowhere near an office and you may only see that person once a month. But that's, that once a month is really rich time when you're collaborating. And, and actually, if you're comfortable they're doing their role, just like you, Nick, my view is as a leader, if I'm comfortable they're doing their job, I care less about where they work. I just yeah. care that they're doing their yeah. job. So I think it's increasing flexibility. It's pulling those levers that we do have the ability to pull. So development is a great area. I think it's a really broad and interesting sector to be part of. It's also small enough that you can network very, very easily. So you can get your brand known. You know, you can, you, you know, you could try G15. You could try somewhere up north. You could try all different sort of flavors of, of, of what's available. But at the moment, I do agree that there is a real issue with retaining. Um, and I think it's because as the market has become flooded, people have started to look outside and see what else is is available. Just on the geography, you know, we, we might be Yorkshire by name, but we've got people in Scotland, in Norfolk. You know, I've got somebody who works at an exact level in Essex. And we've got somebody in, in the Netherlands. There are huge numbers of talented people who uh, who live and work in Yorkshire as well. Okay, uh, thanks for being there. All right, Jason, over to your last question on cybersecurity, which I'm really excited to, to dig into. When I start to talk cybersecurity, people's eyes are going to start to glaze yeah. over. So this is definitely something that CIOs are constantly thinking about, but actually it's something that more, mm -hmm. I think, appropriately entire executive teams should be aware of and their corporate responsibility, because ultimately a huge significant asset of any organization is its data, what it can do with that data, but it's our responsibility to protect it as best it can. So knowing we've probably all seen over sector press, the amount of sort of increase in both sort of prevalence and I guess level of threats across the sector in the cyberspace. So my question was, how are organizations ensuring that they're sufficiently focusing on cybersecurity given where we are with all the increased threats oh gosh um if you want to know what people people are probably the, the question i get asked the most is as a chief executive what keeps you awake at night and i i don't hesitate i say cyber security uh, genuinely because for a number of reasons but i think if you look at certainly our our organization it's now the biggest risk on our risk register and it's let's be honest it's not a case of if there's a successful attack it's when and i suppose it's that it's that sort of pragmatism around at some point somebody is going to get through because you know these these people are very clever and they are ahead of us. It's a bit like criminals and the police. You know, the criminals are always sort of slightly slightly half a step ahead of, of, of where the police are. And I think, you know, like we've seen, as, as you've said, Jason, across the sector, a recent spate of attacks. Um, interestingly, there are probably double the number of attacks to those that are reported in the press. Um, I know of several organisations that are keeping things under wraps, but have had, you know, significant business interruption 
and and I know one organisation that sort of four months on still isn't back up and running properly. So this is a major, major problem. And, you know, there are lots of, of attacks that we're managing to filter out and that we're capturing. But what's interesting is they're getting much more sophisticated. They are clearly doing research on key individuals in organisations, who they are linked to, and are then targeting individual people in a very, very sophisticated way. And for me, the weak link in all of this is people. As humans, it's whether, you know, we're tired or whether it's the 158th email of the day and you just click that link that you quite, you know, if you weren't tired or whatever, you probably wouldn't, you, you would never touch. But it's people yeah. who are the weak link in this. So for me, it's a, it's a constant thing around communication, testing, training, communication, testing, training, and then, and then in the background, recovery. How will we recover when um, X or Y event happens? So it's about how, how robust your business continuity planning is as well. But, you know, if people aren't cited on, on cybersecurity or if they roll their eyes and yawn or, you know, do all the things that, you know, I've, I've seen people do, then I would say that they are at much greater risk of a big problem heading their way. Yeah. Uh, so I, yeah, it's it's sorry, it's it's ending it's ending the podcast on a downer from my side of things. But um, but I think you know my my one takeaway from today would be if you do nothing else, prepare for when it happens because it will happen. It's just the no. degree of severity that it's your business is the only bit in this that you've got any control over. And I think that, you know, for me as well, sort of, I guess, give my views and tips for, 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 for sort of people listening to the podcast in this space is threats are increasing. You know, uh, Nick sort of spoke there about some things that are referred to as you know, impersonation attempts, ransomware. This is stuff that historically people think of cyber as, well, they can get in a back door and they can sort of play around with some data. We are talking now wholesale shutdown of entire technical yeah. estates where yeah. organisations are unable to function and are unable to contact their own residents. So, you know, they can be small and they can be huge issues. For me, one of the biggest sort of initial focuses would be adopt some form of framework. So you can, there are many out there. I won't go into that detail now, but first of all, adopt a framework, have a plan, have a strategy and stick to that. Start to implement the, the base controls that you feel you need to protect the organization and again completely agree with nick it's actually really nice to hear a chief exec spouting it because it means that at least some some of the things that, that our cios are saying are going in that you know basically put the controls in place but educate your employees any organization's biggest weakness is its staff you can have the most locked down estate it will take one lapse of concentration to open you up potentially to significant risk so there's a lot of great space in the sector here any listeners that want to find out more i'm more than happy to kind of share share some thoughts but this for me is a real area where i don't see hh really being competitors as such you know as, as nick was saying earlier you know people don't really have a choice always with who who their landlord is but this is really a space where we can we can share some best practice to help help each other out because ultimately the person that's going to that's going to sort of lose out is either going to be the resident or the, or the employee because it's going to be their data that gets breached. Just to respond to Jason really about is, is glad that chief, the messages landed with chief execs um, you should worry if the messages landed with chief execs Jason because they are the least listened to person in any business. Uh, people smile and nod uh, but people generally go away and carry on doing their own thing. The most listened to person in most businesses is the FD so if you get across to them what the financial consequences are that really does get uh, get people's attention. There you go. Nick, I'm cautious that you said that we were ending on a bit of a diner with the cybersecurity, so I definitely don't want that. So I thought I will, uh, I would chuck in a little plot twist question uh, for you both, and that is, what is your mantras? Mantra, what a good question. Live in the moment. People plan ahead too much, and I think I can't even claim credit for that. That's one of the best lessons that my uh, long-suffering wife has given me live in the moment and enjoy it i would probably say treat people as you want to be treated i think ultimately we come to work every day we share the same square foot of carpet with people and ultimately if you can if you can build really good trusted relationships i think anything is possible love that 
for me, I would say just go easy on yourself. If you're starting a new sector or, you know, coming in with fresh ideas, but it's not really going the way you wanted it to, like, just, just trust the process. It takes time. And we all spend a lot of a lot of time working as well. So just go easy on yourself. Take it all in. And yeah, just keep doing what you're doing. Really, that's kind of it for me. All right. Well, listen, we'll have to wrap it up there, guys. But I just want to say a massive thank you to you both. It's been really nice getting to know you over the last few months. The sector are incredibly lucky to have minds like yourselves as well uh, involved with the projects that you're a part of. And I really hope it's not too long before we have you on again. All right. Take care. Thanks again, guys.